suspense with that then. There's um, lots of uh, reasons for starting in Maori, apart from the, uh, the usual and most important ones, but on the topic that we're talking about tonight, um, it's a good reminder to start with the fact that some of the topics we're going to be discussing are viewed entirely differently from different cultures. So the battle at the moment, uh, it does feel like a battle sometimes, around the uh, causes of psychosis and schizophrenia in the Western well, it's, it's largely between the medical model and the more psychosocial model. Um, but from a Maori perspective, um, that isn't particularly interesting because things like hearing voices uh, don't really need a, a causal explanation at all. And the uh, best illustration of that is one of uh, my, I should say my, one of the PhD students I had the honor of working with, uh, Dr. Melissa Taitima, did a, a wonderful study surveying Maori about how they understand <coughs> extraordinary experiences. Um, and as a supervisor, I asked her to include the question, what do you think causes them? Because that's what I'm interested in. She didn't want to do that. Um, but she did, and came back three years later with a big smirky grin on her face. Uh, and I said, well, so what did they say? And, and she said, they didn't understand the question. <laughs> She heard lots of these lovely, uh, rich quotes about asking me what causes, causes, causes voices is like asking me why the sun comes up in the morning. So just as a reminder that, um, to some extent, it's uh, a narrow sort of debate I'm going to steer you through. Uh, thank you for coming. I only do Maori, not bad about the Maori. I don't do Chinese, Russian, Spanish, or Swedish. Sorry, though. Um, but welcome in whatever language. And it's really um, especially nice for me to see so many people who have supported and inspired me over the years. Uh, it really means a lot to me that you've come. And perhaps equally important, quite a few people that I, I don't know. So at least be a few people in the audience who haven't heard the jokes 15 times <laughs> already, so that's, that's helpful. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that my father is here, and two of them in flesh and one in spirit, I'm sure, my partner, Emma, and uh, Dr. Emma Davies and my son Ben. I'm very pleased that you're here. It's not doing anything to calm the nerves, however, but um, Emma tells me repeatedly that I'm tw my work is wonderful, but I'm 20 years too late. And that's because Emma does a lot of work advising governments uh, nationally and locally about how to implement policies that will prevent problems later in life, focusing on the first five years of life. So there is one slide on primary prevention so I don't get in trouble when I get home later tonight. Now I'm told it's uh, customary, um, when Fred gave his uh, inaugural lecture a couple of weeks ago, he said there were some guidelines for these things, which scared me a bit, and I still haven't found them. <laughs> but I'll follow Fred's, uh, Fred's guidance, and you're supposed to talk a little bit about yourself um, on your journey, and I've never had a problem doing that. Um, <laughs> as I explained to her, in the first 20 minutes of my, the eight hours that I spend with the undergrads, I always talk about myself. And I say there's two reasons for that. Firstly, because I have narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> and you will find yourselves in the diagnostic manual on several pages also. Um, but also because this is such a subjective area that, that the question, what causes mental health problems, is so subjective that I think it's important to present to students um, that it is actually your life experiences and your values that influence your beliefs and what you do about these things as much as the research. And that their job is to try and find a middle, middle ground between objectivity and subjectivity. Um, so I will tell you a couple of quick stories. Um, one, when I was trying to... Um, I've got to back up already, I've lost, lost myself already, because the member of my China who isn't here is uh, my daughter Jessica, who is in Christchurch. She's the link here to what's coming later. It will all become clear. To me, at least. If it may be not to you. Uh, when Jessica's down in Christchurch, uh, would have been here, I'm sure, but is studying for her law exams down in Christchurch. 
Now, obviously as parents we tried very hard to persuade Jessica <coughs> not to stay in Christchurch for various reasons, but she is very stubborn. We have no idea where she got that from. <laughs> um, and she's still there. And the other reason I like to um, raise her is because when she was uh, trying to decide what to study at university, she looked up from her long lists, she likes to make lists and pros and cons and things like that, uh, which is very healthy, I suppose. Um, <laughs> she looked up and said to us, to her mother as well, you know, mum and dad, there must be a way to try and change the world and be happy. <laughs> and you two haven't figured that out. Now, now the link is, when I was trying to decide what to do at university, I had no idea, I had no list, I didn't even know what the topics were available at university, and my life was a bit of a mess. And my good days were spent trying to figure out um, why the rest of the world was so screwed up or anybody over 25, and my bad days were spent trying to figure out why I was so screwed up. So I wasn't in too good shape. And you know, psychology sort of maybe would help me a little bit, perhaps. Uh, all I knew about psychology was uh, the name Freud, and all I knew about Freud was he wrote about sex. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> so this was obviously the subject for me, and I... <laughs> psychology laboratory um, where I had to drop a ball bearing next to a snail. <laughs> to, <laughs> don't well understand this. To, to measure the habituation of the horn withdrawal response in the snail. Now unfortunately I was the last one there and several hundred undergraduate students have been <laughs> dropping the ball bearing next to the snail for several days and the poor thing just was totally traumatised <laughs> and just stared at me and wouldn't withdraw it slowly. <laughs> It's the first and only time I've ever made up any data. <laughs> I'm aware there's one of the levels of the press here, so I can just see the head of Professor Reed finally admits that he's made up all the data. Anyway, uh, moving on, um, more relevantly to what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, my very first job as an apologist to those of you who have heard these stories many, many times, my very first job as a nursing attendant in, in New York in a psychiatric hospital. And I'll tell you just two stories. Uh, there's always many from these places. They're quite mad places. When will we ever get past the idea that it's a good thing to round up the hundred most distressed and distressing people in the community and put them in the same building? Um, so in the middle of the night, there I was with Bob, who had not opened his eyes for four days and was black and blue from having done so. I don't recommend you try this at home. And out of boredom, really, rather than clinical judgment, I asked him why he had his eyes closed. And he put his face right there. Oh, God, John, wrong question. And he said, it's about effing time one of you assholes asked me that. He didn't say effing. <laughs> and he opened his eyes. You see, we had all been looking up eye closed behavior in the diagnostic manual. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with him? So we wouldn't know what kind of pills he had. <laughs> um, we then sat down and had a nice cup of tea, well you never have a nice cup of tea, it's always disgusting I suppose, but we had a cup of tea and he explained to me, his eyes wide open, that I was put into this hospital by my family against my will to get insight. And that's what I've effing well been doing. <laughs> have to think about that one. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, and of course that taught me, if you want to know what's going on with somebody, uh, it's probably a good idea to, to ask them. <laughs> it is funny, but in the many, many years that I've worked in mental health services before I returned to academia, I found that often this is not the case. That we think we know what's going on by applying a label or a diagnosis. And, and the argument goes like this. And this is the conversation I had, my very first conversation with a psychiatrist all those years ago, and I really, really wanted to learn about why these people do these weird things like hear voices people are allowed to get them and so forth. And the ex explanation is they do it because they have schizophrenia. Okay, so how do you know they've got schizophrenia? Well, they're doing the sorts of things that schizophrenic people do. And it's kind of convincing at one level, because when you think about it, it's actually backward circular mm. logic, it's sort of about, without being insulting to eight-year-olds, it's about an eight-year-old sort of level of, of, of cognitive function. And, and it's, it's called the, 
there is a name for it, a category fallacy. And it's the idea that if you can come up with a word for something, you have explained it. So what's causing all these bizarre things that are going on? The schizophrenia is causing it. But schizophrenia is just a word. Um, on a more serious note, I should uh, another more serious story. I was um, specialing, as they call it, um, a young woman, well, same age as me, I was 20. She was 20, and we were locked together into a room, the quiet room. And my job was to stop her from killing herself. And she had tried many, many times to kill herself by smacking her head into the wall. And I, I think she was probably a more nervous than I was, but only just. Um, and I came out with a wonderful, clinically skilled, comment, if you'd like to talk to me, that would be good, but if you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't. <laughs> well, not the, not the first day. The second day, and she said, my, and that's all. The third day, she said, father, and I thought, okay, we can do this one word at a time. But the next day, she said nothing. The following day, she said me, so we now have my father. And when we got the family history, we found that the missing word was raped. And that taught me so many things, including the ambivalence with which people in these situations try and tell you what has actually gone on. Will I be believed? Is it safe to tell? Is it not safe to tell? I'll half tell and see if he gets it. Um, she hadn't spoken for three months, and that was explained by the fact that she had something called catatonic schizophrenia, because that's what catatonic is. <clears throat> anyway, 20 years later, I returned to academia, and after spending many years uh, as a clinical psychologist and managing mental health services in, in, in Britain and, and New Zealand, um, it was clear to me what I wanted to research when I um, got back to academia. So that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about. So, some acknowledgements, first of all. Um, and I particularly want to draw attention to all the wonderful postgraduate students, including the ones that are in the room now, whose name will be on the list as soon as you finish and hand it to them. Many of these people are here today, which is lovely. And many people I've had the honor to work with around the world. And our own team here at Tamaki, the clinical psychology team, who are, who are a lovely bunch of people, um, including Cheryl and Sue, our administrators, who are they're the ones who helped me, who teach me how to use a scanner. Unfortunately, I have to teach me that once a week. <laughs> so we're going to be covering um, a guided tour, uh, touching on a few topics. Um, probably too likely for each one, because each one is probably a two-hour lecture. So that's our rough agenda. So just to um, put, a, put us in perspective, um, where we are today, in terms of what, what I mean by the medical model, or, or don't put it more uh, eloquently, um, this is just one of many, many examples we can, we can cite to show that something is badly wrong with our mental health services. Um, these figures are out of date, but listen to what's up to date. Two, two weeks ago, we, it's currently 10 to 11 percent of everybody, every adult in New Zealand has been prescribed antidepressants every year. What's that about? And since, like most other mental health um, treatments, uh, it's prescribed twice as often to women, um, the figures are about one in seven, or now one in six women in New Zealand prescribed antidepressants. Now, I like to play uh, Devils and Heroes, which is a bad game to play, but it's all his fault. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the 19th century, um, psychiatry had not, uh, unlike its, uh, its medical um, other medical disciplines which have been discovering real illnesses at a fast rate of knots. Psychiatry had come up with nothing um, for a long time. It's fallen into disrepute. And Lord Crackley came up with a wonderful idea of lumping together several hundred different types of behaviours and calling them something. And um, this was to become schizo schizophrenia. And I just, uh, as I love to read to undergraduates, I only read you a few. Um, this will explain why we've been, uh, partly how we've got to this silly situation we're in today, because people still believe in this construct. Schizophrenics conduct themselves in a free and easy way. They laugh on serious occasions. They are rude and impertinent towards their superiors. They challenge them to duels. They lose their deportment and personal dignity. They go out in untidy and dirty clothes, and they go with a lighted cigar into church. <laughs> Now, 
patients are in love with a ward mate with complete disregard of sex, ugliness, or even repulsiveness. <laughs> it would be funny, it is funny, but it's also incredibly sad um, because we do still use this term. It does not all bad stuff, even if, if, if you're particularly good uh, for the symptom of schizophrenia. A heterophrenic schizophrenic, sometimes, whose very speech was confusion, held the cigar holder into the mouth of another patient suffering from muscular atrophy. He did this with a patience and indefatigability of which no normal person would ever be able. <laughs> and if it's not clear to you yet that this is just a list of broken social norms, um, perversions like homosexuality and similar anomalies are often indicated in the whole behavior and dress of the schizophrenic patient. So we'll put him away, shall we? <laughs> and then we can begin to wonder why, when we started doing reliability studies in the 1970s, um, there was, we found there was no reliability to this construct at all. Which is important scientifically, but it's also important because it's such a powerful word and it damages people's lives. So it is important for us to know in mental health, every time we use this word, we are talking nonsense in terms of it being a construct that people can uh, agree about uh, what it is and therefore do uh, sensible research into what's causing it. Of course, the, some of you will know this study, the most famous study, the most fun study, the one we all like to have done, but would never get through ethics committee down, was, was called on the insane in insane places. It didn't have the largest numbers, it had only 10. And a very naughty uh, psychologist, David Rosenham, sent 10 of his graduate students, he got 10 of his graduate students, to ring up the local psychiatric hospital and say, I'm hearing the words empty and fur. They all got admitted. Nine of the ten got diagnosed with schizophrenia, and then their job was to get out. <laughs> and they could have. Well, they're not still there. Well, <laughs> <that's> not, <laughs> um, it took them a long time to get out. And um, they were, because it was an experiment, they took copious notes. And when Rosenhan went in later to look at the notes, there was things like bizarre schizophrenic light like note tickle. <laughs> <laughs> the point of this is that once you've got this label, whatever you do, it's filtered. Um, through the label. The psychiatrists and hospital managers understandably were a bit peed off about this and said, this is not fair, you didn't give us any warning. <laughs> Whatever. So Rosenham, as I said, being the North is a fair enough, sorry about that, we'll do it again next year. January 1st, December 31st, we'll come back at the end of the year, you tell us. We're we'll back at the end of the year and the psychiatrist who have been carefully you now using their best behaviour, of course, making sure they got using their scientific constructs, had decided that 21% of the patients admitted that year were pseudo patients. But Rosenham had not sent any A slightly more traditional sort of uh, research is uh, this one in, in the 90s, where, by which time we had 16 diagnostic systems for schizophrenia. And that those different systems led to between 1 and 203 out of 240 patients <coughs> being diagnosed with schizophrenia. Today, because we keep progressing. Today, this is the situation. You need two of those five. 